Hey everybody, I'm James Lindsay and this is a new Discourses podcast. I need to talk to you about something very important today. The idea I want to get across is that communism doesn't know how. So I ran into this Twitter thread recently on the stupid bird app that makes it really clear and I thought to myself how important it is that people learn to spot this fact about communist ideologies which are all over the place right now whether you don't know if you don't know that you know the woke stuff is buried deep in it it's it's basically neo-marxism that's picked up postmodern tools and that means it has this sort of communist flavored utopia at the end of its woke rainbow so i need people to understand how important it is but i need people to understand how I didn't say that well. I need people to understand what's going on with that and how important it is that that communism doesn't know what it's talking about. So I want people to be able to see that where it comes up. I want people to understand it. I want people to get it and see it when it's there so they can spot it, not fall for it, uh, and most importantly, and maybe even help other people see it and not fall for it and call it out or whatever. It's just so damn important to understand this about communism. You know, I spent a lot of time when I was young trying to figure out why communism is so seductive, why so many people get pulled into it. There are a lot of reasons, um, and one is because it's 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 set up this way. And it's if you don't if you don't see the holes which are there, if you don't see the holes, um, then then it's easy to fall for, right? It's easy to think it's smarter or better than it is. So the thing is, uh, and it is that communism doesn't know how. That's the title of the episode. That's the idea I want to get across. That's a meme I want stuck in people's head. Communism doesn't know how. It doesn't know how humans work. It has like one of the worst theories of humans that I've ever seen in my life. It has no concept. It's really baked up by people who don't understand how human beings work, whether they're psychopathic, whether they're personality disordered, whether they're, you know, something. I don't want to like shame autistic people, but there's this disconnection from how human beings actually operate. And has a terrible theory of human. Communism has a terrible theory of human. And wokeness has like the worst theory of human that I've ever seen. It's like they've taken the bad, at least communism kind of had a sense of what humans are like. But wokeness is the worst model of of humanity I've ever seen in my life. The worst model of humans. Well, it turns out that it doesn't know how society works either. It's got all these stupid ideas that are like, oh, you know, everything's just cooperative and blah, blah, blah. And if, you know... You just make it so that nothing bad is happening to people. Then they'll all want to cooperate and share and help. They have no concept of where violence comes from. They have no concept of self-interest and how it actually works. They have no concept of competition. They have no concept of the fact that some people are just jerks. They have no concept of humanity, no concept of human beings, no concept of society. They just don't know what they're talking about. But most importantly, and this is the part that I want to focus on, It doesn't know how to achieve what it wants to achieve. When I say communism doesn't know how, I mean that even with all of, if we were to grant all the rest of it, if it did have a good model of humans, if it did have a good model of society, it still wouldn't be able to do what it wants to do because it doesn't know how to get there. It doesn't have a plan. They literally don't have a clue. No freaking idea. And it's not exactly a feature of communism. It's not like the communists sat down and wrote like, We don't know what we're doing. It's not like that, okay? So it's not exactly a feature of communism, but it's not a bug either. And it's because it it has an or an origin. They they have a bad model of something else as well. This bogus concept that's called historicism, which basically believes that history, and we could make that capital H history, like it's this uh, singular entity. Uh, unfolds according to fixed laws and with a a particular trajectory. In fact, that there's a purpose to history to get from some very rudimentary or regressed state to some very progressed state and that it's going to, in fact, a utopia at the end of the communist rainbow, as I phrased it and some other things. That there's this idea that history has a fixed trajectory and it's going to unfold that way as things go, and they have a process that they talk about how that's going to unfold. It's a dialectical process, they call it, uh, which is the ex- exposure of the contradictions that prevent it from already being perfect. And so it believes that, that history is going to unfold according to fixed laws with a partic- particular trajectory with a purpose toward utopia in mind. And this unfolding of history for people who are in this broadly communist bent can either be sped up or it can be hindered by the actions of human beings, but it's going where it's going regardless. Okay, so 
And, and until it gets there, everything's there are all these problems, there are all these systems of power, there are all these dominations and oppressions. In, in particular, there's all this exploitation. And what happens is at the end of history, there's no more exploitation. Everything's perfect. And so you have humans who want to maintain the exploitative status quo order, conservatives or reactionaries or rightists or right-wingers. And then you have the progressives or the leftists or the communists who want to be on the right side of that history that's unfolding toward that, that utopia at the end of the rainbow inexorably. So basically what you have is a situation where there's a utopia in the future. It's coming. We're going to get there anyway. It's inevitable. History is unfolding toward it. But then you have all these people who are, you know, broadly conservatives who get branded as reactionaries or regressives who want to keep the order the way that it is exploitatively and are therefore preventing or slowing down that unfolding of history. They're putting a roadblock on the way to utopia. This is literally an article of faith for communism. Okay, so all communist shaped things, whether that's actual Marxism, whether that's a neo-Marxist revamp through liberationism, whether it's whatever wokeness has done with the new invention of, of liberation that they've kind of taken up that's all tied up in so-called justice, you know, social justice, racial justice, climate justice, health justice, 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 justice. When we get there, we'll have a perfectly just world. That's the vision now. So it went from liberation to justice uh, or communism to liberationism to justice. But they still talk about liberation, of course. And so their idea is that it will get there and you have either been a helper or a hindrance and that society will have the right to judge you accordingly. On the wrong side of history, maybe you're like Abe Lincoln, they got to throw your statue in the lake. You weren't perfect. You weren't on the right side of history, even though you're one of the most progressive f figures in human history. Not good enough. You're going in the lake. Um, you've got to be torn down. Your names have, has to be taken off of, uh, off of statues. You've got to be forgetting, forgotten, kind of in a perpetual revolution to a new year zero every year. All of the sins of the past have to be destroyed and forgotten so that they don't mislead anybody and keep people from that progressive unfolding of history. This is, I'm not exaggerating. This is one of the central articles of faith within communist shaped ways of thinking. And because of that, in this regard, it is ultimately a religion. It has a metaphysical structure. It has all of the trappings. People are talking about this all the time. But it's a, it's a religion that believes that history unfolds according to particular laws to a particular kind of heaven on earth. And that once every, all the conditions are made right, they call this millenarianism. Once the conditions are all made right, then the utopia will arrive, whether that's through the idea that Hegel had, that the Weltgeist will realize itself and become the absolute spirit, the eschaton will emanatize and suddenly we'll be living in a society that's governed by a state that's taken up with perfected ideas, or whether that's Marx who believed that, that capitalism would give way to socialism eventually, which is this managed state on its way to, to by the proletariat, which has been awakened and seized power, the means of economic productions. And then that's going to eventually lead to a communist perfected state where all of a sudden the state doesn't need to exist anymore. And it realizes because the ideas of the society are perfect, the, the, the operation, the economic operation of society is perfect. And so now we no longer actually need to have a managed state at all. So socialism falls away to communism. It's, it's the same idea. This is a very religious belief. It's a travesty, that a, a catastrophe actually, that in per earlier eras of American history, we have had the attempt and come close to having the Supreme Court, for example, name communism as a religion, and then to back off and say, no, it's not because it's materialist. It has absolutely a a magical and transcendent view of history that is not materialist. They just don't have in specific a deity. But since there's this idea that future generations and the spirit in, of, of the world in which they live, you know, how kids these days are going to look back 20 years ago and look at something like the TV show Friends and say, oh, it's so problematic, or Seinfeld, it was so problematic. That's got to be obliterated. The spirit of the future age is the thing that turns into kind of the moral judge and it's utterly a merciless judge, right? Merciless judge. And so that is, I mean, it's, in that sense, it's, it's absolutely religious. And the, the metaphysics is ultimately the one laid out by Hegel in his phenomenology of spirit and then taken up by the progressives in the young Hegelian line 
that were the ones who inspired Marx. And so we actually do have a religion here with articles of faith, and you can kind of see how it works. But what's going on, and this is the key thing, is they don't know how any of this is supposed to work because it's just an article of faith about how history unfolds. History unfolds for itself. So they don't know how. So communism doesn't know how. That's the thesis, right? That's what we're going to get into. And so usually it's really hard to see that. You've got to kind of read between the lines to figure out that communism doesn't have the slightest idea how to make itself work. Because it doesn't have the slightest idea how it's going to go. So you have to read like tens of thousands of complicated words and all of this sweeping language, and, you know, advanced theoretical language. It's all smarty pants. It's the kind of crap a scholar would, would write and convince himself of. It's all very high-minded and all of this and very complicated jargony language that hides the fact that it's ultimately sophistry that's defending a failed theory of history and and kind of hiding that um and when you read it what you get caught up in is what it's actually doing which is primarily that it's allegedly analyzing i say allegedly because i don't think it's really analyzing it's bitching about or complaining about society it's talking about how society isn't the way they wish it was but then they call that analysis so it's allegedly kind of analyzing society and it's talking about how things could be different and then how things will be different as they unfold and what forces are standing in the way of that. And it can actually be really inspiring if you don't notice that all of the how is missing. The recipe does not include how you're actually going to get there, right? It'd be like almost like you're given this whole recipe for a cake or something like that. And then you're told um, not how to put the, rest the, the recipe together and how to bake it, but instead, you know, you're just given this kind of list of things that like are in the way of a perfect baking and then the cake is done. So you, instead of telling you, you know, oh, mix all of these things, it says, you know, something like a lot of mixers are broken and the mixers are made by by capitalist companies that just want to make your money and they have planned obsolescence built into them and they have absolutely no intention of, of doing whatever. Or even it just starts talking about something else entirely, you know, uh, that has nothing to do with the actual how. The how isn't there. And you maybe won't notice it because a lot of the language is very sweeping, it's very visionary, and it can be very inspiring. So communism doesn't know how, and it writes its tracts mostly because they're fooling themselves, because most of them are absolutely true believers in this, that this is the way that the world has to go. It, it, it writes it in a way where it's very difficult to notice that they've left out the instructions. It's kind of amazing. So, for example, like you could read Herbert Marcuse's neo-Marxist stuff. For example, repressive tolerance. You know, I read that for you guys before here on the New Discourses podcast in a four-part series. So if you have time, I know it takes a while. It's like four hours. But if you have time, go back and listen to that again. And if you pay attention, you'll see. Marcuse never really says anywhere in there how any of this magical perfect society that he's talking about, he, you know, at the beginning he says that the, the state doesn't exist anywhere in the world yet. Nowhere on earth does such a such a civilization or such a such a state exist, and that he refers to it as a historical possibility that's only regarded now as a as a utopian possibility because that's what it is. He he never actually tells you how you get there. He just tells you that there are all these problems in society organized around the way that tolerance is unbalanced. He doesn't tell you how to get to the utopia. He just says that if we were to revamp how we think about tolerance then we could get to something better. And it's kind of just an underlying assumption that the the society that doesn't yet exist anywhere on Earth doesn't exist because all the societies have all of these weird, tyrannical, and, and, and oppressive and fascistic views that uh, tolerance maintains. So if we just fix tolerance and make it perfect for his vision, then obviously a more perfect society might emerge. Those historical possibilities might emerge, you know, and the utopia is what he's actually talking about. And so he just talks about all this stuff throughout the whole essay that he thinks is in the way, you know, which to boil it down is namely the existence of conservatives who have rights and a society that will hold leftists to account when they screw up or go psychopathic. So in repressive tolerance, the idea that Marcuse puts out really is that if we just suppress all of the right wing so-called reactionary vo voices and, and prevent them from being able to even think, censoring them, even pre-censoring them, that'll prevent right wing violence, show them absolutely no tolerance that will prevent them from being able to prevent society from progressing along its progressive track. And on the other hand, if we let leftists who are in favor of this vision, uh, this liberation, liberated vision of society, we let them run amok, tolerate everything they say and do, including violence, 
you know, let them let them do whatever they want with basically infinitely to, infinite tolerance, then a better liberated society, his liberationist utopia, might just emerge. That's really what the, the repressive tolerance essay is arguing. So he has this horrific argument about censoring everything to the right and absolutely not censoring anything to the left, tolerating leftist violence, absolutely not even tolerating sense uh, the speech of right wingers lest it you know pre-censoring he even says pre-censoring that's actually his word that he justifies so that the right wing can never even think the thought of trying to prevent society from creeping into his utopia through this magical historicism so there's literally no plans there for making any of it actually work he just gives this analysis of so-called analysis of tolerance and says that if you know tolerance was rebalanced to stop the right wing from ever having any effect and were to allow left leftists to run amok well then obviously we would achieve a, a leftist utopia the liberation is at hand and so he just kind of complains about things and, and has this very totalitarian argument about how we're going to apply totalitarianism and then wham you know we're on our way to a utopia this is communism it doesn't know how but it does know that it can force people to play its way and then later on it'll wash it away and say you know real communism was never tried so it's basically for Marcuse, get rid of conservatives, get rid of right-wing thought, get rid of the status quo entirely, get rid of the police, get rid of the military, and we're gold. It doesn't come quite come out and just say that. You kind of have to wade through like three hours of reading this complicated nonsense to realize that he never actually points out how it's going to work. So he's pretty subtle um, in comparison to some of this other stuff. But you see the same kind of theme, though, in, in his 1969 essay on liberation. So his communist utopian dream is liberationism. And it really gets into the meat of this liberationist idea. I'm going to read most of that essay. It's longer than repressive tolerance. So I think I'm going to probably skip at least one of the parts. I haven't sorted out how much I want to skip. That's why I haven't done it yet. But um, it's, it's broken down in four parts, and I'll read it to you soon and kind of do the same thing I did with repressive tolerance. But in there, he talks about the importance of aesthetic sum. That's in the second part. That's actually probably the part I'll skip because it's a little bit of, it's important and interesting, but it's a little bit far afield of getting the, the gist of, you know, how terrible of an idea his liberationist thought is. Um, but other than that, and then in this paragraph or two near the end where he talks about how ends justify the means for leftist movements. Yeah, ends justify the means, of course. So, you know, you get to be out of control or whatever, so you can get to liberation. Other than that, he doesn't really talk about how liberation is to be achieved at all. The aesthetics part, he kind of touches. You know, we got to have certain aesthetics. We got to tap into aesthetics. So he has a little bit of practical plans, but there is no how liberation works. There's no explanation of how the liberated society is going to work, where you have all of this freedom to do whatever you want and basically no responsibility on you. He doesn't have any articulation of how that's going to work. And in fact, the very first primary section of the essay, after the little introduction, basically says that human beings aren't biologically suited to liberationist utopian life yet. There's something wrong with people. Maybe people have been basically biologically conditioned or, um, how should I put it, like a selectively bred through a capitalist history to not be ready to accept liberation. So now we have to figure out how to remake human beings biologically. We have to make man biologically different so he can accept liberationism. So like that's part of his plan is, oh yeah, so how are we going to get to liberation? Well, well, we'll remake human beings to want that. And when they all want it and they, that's their core set of needs and interests, then it'll just happen, right? Because that's what people want and that's how people operate. So his argument effectively, and I don't exaggerate, effectively boils down to the idea that human beings as we are now cannot actually have liberations. But so if we, his, his idea of how is we're going to remake people at a fundamental level to be different than we actually are, to change human nature. And if we change, just change human nature at the biological level, well, then the, then the liberation, the liberated utopia can emerge. I mean, this is new Soviet man stuff all over again. It's just a new liberated man, if you will. And if you don't know about the new Soviet man, I mean, that was a terrible idea the Soviets had that, you know, men had to be remade for Soviet life, for communism, because for whatever set of reasons, they were rejecting it. Um, and so how are we supposed to get to this liberation utopia, though, for, for Marcuse? No idea. We just get all the bad stuff out of the way, get the aesthetics right, remake man at a biological level, and it'll show up. This is the stupid historicism 
Again, there's no actual plan. They don't know how it's going to work. And that's the key. That's the thing I need to get through to you. It's a stupid historicism that goes all the way back through neo-Marxist thought. It's in woke thought. It goes through neo-Marxist thought. It goes through Marxist thought before that. It's in the progressive young Hegelian thought. And it has its seeds, therefore, in the Hegelian thought that I still promise I'll talk to you about eventually. And by the way, this this new Soviet man or liberated man, whatever you want to have, whatever however you want to put it, who's been remade biologically to be suited to the utopia that we can't have until that occurs. Um, that's just an admission that they don't know how to get there, right? They don't have a, pl- a workable plan that we're going to change society. We're going to change, you know, whatever's going on in society to make it work. We're just, maybe if we just remake people, right? If we just remake people so they crave it. Uh, and and if, if, if we just all believe in it well enough, um, so that we'll even be willing to remake humans at a biological level to accept it, then it'll work out. That's the depth of their plan. There's some details involved in completely remaking the economic system and handing over governance, you would think, but no, they don't have that. This is dangerously idiotic, and that's the truth, even without having to recognize that both genocides and eugenics are basically baked right into this. Like, if these people had the power, eventually genocide and eugenics are going to come out, which is exactly what we've seen everywhere it's been attempted before. Um, This is just how it goes with communist nonsense. They don't have a plan, but they do have this perfect vision of the future. They just have no idea how to get there. And that's what I want you to understand, and that's what I want to try to draw out in this episode. It's, um, I had a friend who used to work in customer service, uh, in a pretty significant way. And he used to talk about this a lot. It's basically, it's all sell the dream service, the nightmare kind of stuff. That's who you say, you know, sell the dream service, the nightmare. Uh, cause he worked in customer service, the salespeople in his business would go out and sell the dream. And then all the pissed off customers who felt like they got sold something that they wasn't legit wanted their nightmare serviced. And that was his job. So that's the thing, right? Because the communist types think, and that includes the woke, think history will just unfold to a utopia if we get rid of all of the conservative, reactionary, status quo elements of society. We just get those out of the way and let history unfold like it should, faster and faster because progressives are now unchecked. Everything will eventually become perfect. And the less conservatism, the less status quo, the less uh, reactionary, as they say, the more progressive, more progressivism, more leftism, more radicalism, more reimagining, the faster this process goes and we get to the utopia sooner. So every bit of suffering between now and then, supposing that it would actually happen, it lays morally on the shoulders of the people preventing it. So that's why they hate everybody even a half an inch right of themselves. And that's literally a view to, or it's a religious view of history. It is a, it's literally historicism and it's not just wrong, but it's actually dangerously insane. It's completely wrong in a very dangerous way. But as I'm trying to kind of beat around the bush to say, or I'm belaboring a bit, it's kind of hard to see it because they waffle a lot. They sell the dream so well that it's hard. And this is the, the key. They usually sell the dream so well that it's hard to spot the fact that they don't have a realistic plan. You get caught up in the sales pitch. You get caught up in the vision. You get caught up in the argument about how crappy all of these stupid, the, the, you know, problem after problem after problem, the critique, the critical theory, they're going to critique every little thing. They're going to say, oh, well, you'll look at all the, the white supremacy. Look at the history of racism. Look at the, look at the way that consumerism, you know, then marketing gets you to want to buy products and participate in a rat race to work at a job you don't even love so that you can make money so that you can buy crap you don't even need that get you swept up in this kind of cyclone of complaint and visionary utopian dreaming selling that dream and complaining about why you don't have the dream fomenting your your resentment your alienation your discontent and then along the way they maybe maybe will touch upon the service the nightmare part (laughs) <laughs> regarding past attempts, you know, there's lots of great, interesting Marxist and neo-Marxist critiques of Stalin and his failures. And of course, it's always rationalized away the same way by blaming reactionary and bourgeois values on on having crept in as the reason things failed. You know, in, in the essay on liberation, Marcuse even argues that what's needed to overthrow capitalism uh, 
and not fall into the failures of like um, Stalin in particular is that you have to move toward a new socialism that doesn't have bureaucracies. Bureaucratic social, the bureaucracy is where bourgeois values got back in and it created a conservative hierarchy. So you have to figure out a way. Liberationism talks about going to a socialist world on a way to a communist world that doesn't have a bureaucracy to manage it. So what Marcuse says, what liberation is, a liberated world is a socialism without bureaucracy, whatever that's supposed to be. Some kind of freaking magic or something. But the point is that they don't have a plan. They have no damn plan. And that's not easy to see because they ramble on and on selling the dream and problematizing the existing society and getting you caught up in a whirlwind of complaint about your own conditions while kind of positioning this perfect vision as something against it. That's literally what critical theory does. Offer the perfect vision, complain about how society doesn't match that, inspire social activism in its behalf. Those are the three necessary components. Those All three of those have to be present for a theory to be a critical theory inspire the perfect vision, complain about how society doesn't meet it. There's your whirlwind. Get you caught up in this whirlwind of problematizing and critique and then inspire social activists to go basically operate brainlessly in service to this. Well, it's hard to see usually, but luckily some dumb blue check on Twitter did a little thread recently that somebody sent me that made it really explicit. So that should help me make this more obvious to you. And that's where I want to go with this now. I want to read through this thread as best I can and break it down and talk about the fact that communism doesn't know how. It just doesn't. It doesn't have a clue. And they say so explicitly in this thread, which is why it's so good. The goal is to help get you to where you can see this, when and where you run into it, where it crops up, and so that you can you can see it, you can understand it, you can realize that lack of how. That lack of how. And practically speaking, if you're in one of these stupid meetings and they're giving you all this sweeping language about anti-racism and once we have anti-racist this and that, you know, we'll have racial justice. You can start to realize the how is nowhere. There's no how. So you can even start to ask questions. How is this going to work? And they're going to give you more sweeping nonsense because that's all they have is sweeping rhetorical nonsense. And if you just keep asking, how is this supposed to work? I don't understand Make it clear. What are the tangible steps? What does it look like when we get there? Those kinds of questions, you know, are kryptonite. They just, they're not even kryptonite. They're just total acid to this, this stupid communist approach. How are we going to get there? What does it look like when we get there? Tangible stuff, you know, step by step. How is that going to work? Who's going to pay for that? You know, what what are the what are the trade offs for 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 prioritizing this? Can you tell me that in clear language with straightforward definitions and actionable steps? Make it very clear and how it's supposed to work because they don't have a how. So I want people to be able to realize when they run into these kinds of pieces of rhetoric, these kind of ideas, that that's what's going on. And so that's the very important something that I want everybody to understand about communism as a result of having listened to this. Whether that's the old school Marxist communism that's all in the economics, whether it's this newer liberated liberation based neo Marxist critical theory communism, whatever it is that these freaking woke ethno communists are pushing on us, uh, communist ish thing um, that we're headed toward right now. If, you know, this kind of global public private partnership thing, which is this weird, you know, global equity that's global communism mixed with public private partnership that's global fascism that's very much based on Deng Xiaoping's uh, model following Mao of how he revitalized China, where you now have a super capitalist state, but that operates with its entire market owned and controlled and uh, ultimately by the CCP. That's what that's that's the vision right now. I and mean, wokeness is just a tool to get there. Um what I want people to go away understanding, though, is that in all of these cases, communism operates through an assumption of what's basically social alchemy. It doesn't know how. Alchemy didn't know how. Alchemy isn't chemistry. And I, I mean alchemy literally. Like I told you before, all of this stems from, I'm not going to say this is the philosophy of Hegel, but all of this stems from interpretations of the philosophy of Hegel. And Hegel was an alchemist. Literally. He thought that something, societal somethings, could be made out of nothing. That the, 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 the lead in the ideas of society at present could be refined into gold through his dialectical process, where that, the way that works is that if we reveal the contradictions, we find the spiritual impurities in the ideas of the world 
So the, everything contains its contradictions. That's like the spiritual impurities. And if we can reveal those and bring them into a process of, of dialectical synthesis and, and, and achieve those synthesis ideas, then what you do is you get gold out of the lead or out of the base metals. It was the same ideas applied to the to the to the i the, the same concept I should say applied to the ideas in a very broad sense for Hegel of society and that's what Marx did with economics um, and this hasn't gone away it's still alchemy it's still selling this dream that a perfected something can be produced by revealing the contradictions within it on the belief basically though that if just enough people buy into the narrative who buy the the dream that they're selling if they understand they buy into the vision then it'll work and it only works actually when that enough people turns out to be everybody or at least everybody's allowed to go on living there's your gulags and stuff there's your mass graves there's your your uh killing fields in cambodia if everybody if everybody just gets on board eventually things will work out the because it's the the wrong ideas in society the reactionaries the conservatives the status quo, people who want to maintain any aspect of the status quo those people are holding back the dialectical process of the ideas or culture or economics of society so society is going to pro progress for these people this is their faith through an alchemical magical process toward a utopia this is the essence of marx's dialectical materialism which was supposed to be uh taking this dialectical process and putting it into play in the material meaning mostly economic but also somewhat legal realm that's what marx wanted to remake so communism always operates always operates on a set of assumptions that don't work part of that's a historicism there's there's another dimension too and people need to learn to recognize this and understand that there are a lot of reasons why communism doesn't work. We, we talked before briefly that it has a terrible, it doesn't understand human beings. It doesn't understand society. It doesn't understand things like violence. Uh, it doesn't understand markets. Uh, for one, I think, I don't know, it was Hayek or von Mises who, who gave the analysis economically. Von Mises, I think. Um, why socialism or central planning in general doesn't work, which is that the market doesn't just produce goods and services and exchange them it also provides a real uh, uh, an immense amount of information uh, real-time constant feedback about what the market needs and what the market will bear and so there's this information exchange built into the the activity of the market becomes something that central planners can't replicate and so this is just to kind of a quick aside this is a challenging question in the face of, of much more advanced AI AI might be able to do a pretty good job of guessing some of this stuff. And this becomes a much more complicated question in, in that kind of line of thought. But that said, for a lot of, there, there are still a lot of reasons why communism wouldn't work even if the um, central planning aspect could be solved. And the biggest one of those, of course, is not only does it not understand human beings or societies or how people work, it's that it doesn't have a plan to get there. It's, it's Therefore, it's talking about having to create new liberated man or new Soviet man or some new version of humanity that's going to be able to exist within these utopias that it basically cooks up for itself. In the present iteration, it's talking about basically what building what Donna Haraway in the 1980s as a feminist theorist, techno-feminist as they're called, was called, uh, considered the cyborg. If you look at this guy Klaus Schwab in the World Economic Forum, who's kind of pushing a lot of this nonsense, um, and he has the vision of the Great Reset, this guy, he wants to become a cyborg. He wants to become one of the first, like, man machines. This is, And, and these are going to be transcendent humans who then have things like Neuralink plugged into their brain, chips plugged into their brain to make sure that they don't disagree, that they, have, they don't have to be biologically remade if you can just reprogram people like a computer. So it's very frustrating. Um, but at any rate, I don't want to get lost in that AI aside. There are the, the lack of a plan thing is what we're going to focus on now. And it's very interesting and it's very important. This nice thread somebody sent me, I made fun of it on Twitter a bunch of times, um, was sent. It's a blue checked account. The image is like a dog. Um, I don't actually understand how you can have like a really big has like a hundred thousand followers like it's, it's it's awkward underscore duck at awkward duck and i don't understand how you can have like this big account with like a fake name it's like big rally or something big rally 
is like the the handle name here. Um, so you have this big account with no real name and the picture is a dog. I don't know how you can have a verified account like that. Like what's Twitter doing? That's so bizarre. Um, but anyway, I don't know who this person is. We'll take a look at the bio. It says organizer, educator, abolitionist, somebody's mom. I'm not going to get into that part. Um, there's some email given. <laughs> she slash her. Uh, we'll leave all this alone. So I don't know who this is. All I know is it's got about 100,000 followers, and I don't know how you can have a verified account on Twitter with not a real name and not a real picture at all, neither. Um, but whatever, whatever Twitter's doing, everybody's kind of suspicious of this anyway. But this anyway is a great little thread that illustrates what I'm talking about, about the alchemy of communism, and in particular, it's lack of knowing how. In fact, the alchemy that's baked into the heart of the communist ideology, even in its new woke manifestation, its new faces of activism. And I'm just going to kind of read through this thread. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to do what I normally do. I'm going to get caught up and break it down as I go. Um, it's not a long thing, obviously, because it's a Twitter thread. Um, we'll try to talk about it as we go. We'll talk about it a bit more. I'll probably revisit parts. Uh, so what it says, and this is right from the very get-go, the very first, the leading tweet, the first tweet, is really, really short. And it, it says, even if you don't understand how, and the how has stars around it, even if you don't understand how at the moment, you've got to know that abolition is the only way forward. Abolition here means police abolition. It means possibly prison, not possibly, definitely. Abolitionism is the abolition of police and prisons. Uh, that's usually what the word means now. It doesn't mean the abolition of slavery, by the way. That was, that was 150 years ago. So it means the abolition of police and the abolition of prisons. And she mentions police specifically. So um, read this part again, though, right? Even if you don't understand how at the moment, and how is emphasized, even if you don't understand how at the moment, you've got to know that abolition is the only way forward. So right out of the get-go, this is the idea of alchemy, okay? This is the idea of alchemy. They don't know how it's going to work. They even say so. So I know, folks, this is the next tweet. Um, I know folks want an exact answer on how... Uh, they want an exact answer on how, one that they can understand. This isn't the first step. The first step is realizing we have to get away from policing. Even if we don't have, again, this has stars around it, all the answers quite yet. It's not on any one person or group to come up with solutions. This is something we have to create together. We need a critical mass of folks who know we need abolition and believe it is possible. And the, the, the emphasis there is on the is, right? Who believe it is possible because who would believe it's possible that if we just get rid of all the police and prisons that everything's going to work out, right? Uh, believe it, it, it is, that it is possible because obviously it's not. So take the first step. This is back to the tweet, the tweet thread. Take the first step by recognizing police aren't serving us. Even when we name things, we think we need police for, a careful investigation usually shows that police have been largely ineffective. We start by reducing their scope and funding toward the goal of abolition. We start by asking what else needs to be created to cater and serve the needs of the people. We start by scrutinizing our city budgets. We start by centering those most vulnerable of harm. Of course, we're going to have the most vulnerable thing. That's their lever. Vulnerable harm. Ah. But we have to recognize that we have to abolish. We'll figure out the complete how together, leaning on the teachings and writings that already exist by trying stuff out locally and sharing lessons. But it's possible. So just re-articulate that faith, right? But it's possible. We just need more of us in it. Again, the process isn't folks giving the masses all the answers. It's organizing the masses towards the truth. That is that abolition is the only way forward. And coming up with those answers together, instead of asking yourself, what would replace the police? Try, what is it that we actually need to be safe? And then the comments under this are li literally ridiculous, okay? 100% reformation is not possible within the construct as it exists. A rotten foundation will not hold. Got to start anew. 
Exactly. A battered spouse has to think. I'm going to mess that up. Uh, exactly. A battered spa- spouse first has to think, I need to leave the situation where they were able to develop a plan of action. There is no path to abolition. Abolition is the path. All right. This is our, these are articulations of faith, okay? And so this is the thing I want to talk about then. Communism doesn't know how. They don't even want to talk about how. In fact, they say they don't want to talk about how. They're making a thread. This, this person here, whether this person realizes it or not, as an abolitionist uh, of police and pr- probably prisons, is operating in a very neo-communist frame. Th- she's making a thread to explain why activists like her shouldn't have to talk about how any of this is going to work. Because they don't know how it's going to work. They don't have a plan for how it's going to work, and that's the thing you've got to understand. All they know is that we should ask questions about the things that we don't like with an eye toward getting rid of them and then jump into this as a leap of faith that once we get all these bad things out of the way, the good, and it's like the magical utopian good, is going to emerge. That's the central belief, the central article of faith of communism. That's why communism is always going to fail, even if it can solve the central planning problem. Communism completely misunderstands society and the humans within it, Because it believes that the only reason we don't live in a utopia is because some people think the wrong way. In what way is that? Well, in this case, they're not all in on police abolition. If everybody just believed it, we don't need to know how any of this is going to work. We just have to be ready to abolish the police. So for them, it's not about life being full of trade-offs. It's not that anything is, that things are genuinely difficult, that it's actually hard to live. You know, life is dangerous. The world is dangerous. Things happen. Things are complicated. People disagree. It's not even all politics, but within the realm of politics, people disagree. We just had that volcano erupt in in the Caribbean. It, it, that's not politics. Things happen. Life is dangerous and difficult, and Jordan Peterson's excellent about talking about this and, and bringing people back to that fact, that truth. But it, for, for the communists, it's not that there are these challenges. For them... For them, the world isn't perfect, and the only reason why we don't live in a perfect utopia right now in their communist uh, you know, utopia is because there are bad systems in the way held up by people who want to maintain them. They call that the status quo. And so once we can get those bad systems and the people who support them out of the way, the utopia will emerge, and that is the heart of communist of the communist religion. That is the article of faith at the very center of the communist religion. And we can go all the way back to Marx for that. But instead, uh, before we go back to Marx at all, I'm going to read this part again. This is something we have to create together. We need a critical mass of folks who know we need abolition and believe it is possible. We take the first step by recognizing police aren't serving us. Now here comes the questions. Like I said, there's this whirlwind of criticism and these critical questions digging in and undermining our faith in institutions. Um, even when we think, even when we name the things we think we need the police for, a careful investigation usually shows police have been largely ineffective. In other words, when we do a critical theory of policing, we ignore all of the things that police are succeeding in bringing to us. We ignore all of the the constraints and challenges of their job. We ignore all of the difficulties in a complicated, dangerous job where you're dealing with people often acting at their worst under often very suspicious or suspect conditions. You know, maybe they're on drugs. Maybe they're they've committed a crime and they're trying to like cover up for that. Maybe they're panicking. All kinds of crazy stuff going on. Maybe they're armed. Maybe they're dangerous. Maybe they're willing to take bigger risks because they know they're in big trouble. Um, you have to ignore all of that. This is a critical theory. You know, we're just going to complain. It's a whirlwind of complaint. Um, and, and if we, we we just kind of ignore all the things in society that they actually achieve and just focus on the things that they do badly instead of any of the things that they do well and the constraints that they they are under. And when the police are operating well, like many things in government and many things in society, it's actually invisible. When you have really good policing, if you had perfect policing, you would barely ever notice the police. You'd barely ever notice them. You'd barely ever have inter- interactions with them unless you were out of line. And it would be a largely kind of invisible thing, a thing that, that, that's operating in a small scale way that maintains order uh, if it were absolutely perfect, you can read stuff like that in Lao Tzu, you know, in the Tao Te Ching, for example, talking about what the perfect government looks like is a, when it's really functioning, you barely know what's there. 
when it's ideally functioning, you barely know what's there. It's just making things work better with very little imposition. I mean, I know it's an ideal. I'm not trying to piss off any libertarians here who say it's impossible. It's not the point. I'm just saying that the critical theorists are going to ignore all of that stuff, a lot of which turns out to be invisible, and just focus on all the problems they create. So then what do they say? Well, we reduce by, re we, sorry, we start by reducing their scope and funding toward the goal of abolition. So we make them useless and don't give them any money, give them less money, give them less funding toward the goal of abolition. So the whole point is to take that, you know, it's funny to hear progressives say this because they're literally taking an element of the government, the police, trying to drown, make it so small they can drown it in a bathtub, as has been said, you know, and they hated that. Uh, but that's, that's the goal of abolition. Um, they don't even know what's going to replace it. And remember, that's not even on the table. We're not even going to ask that question. Okay. And then so remember, at the very end of here, it says, remember, the question, instead of asking yourself, what would replace a police? Try, what is it that we actually need to be safe? Of course, I can talk about what would replace a police uh, because it'd be a nightmare. Digital policing is a lot of it social credit scores to keep you in line, um, kind of a global panopticon, if you will, that's kind of spying on you constantly and dis discrediting you and demeriting you, policed by drones, policed by little robot dogs or whatever those things are, um, taking the human element out of it completely, um, policed by algorithm, kind of scary stuff, right? But uh, that's not, I mean, I don't think they're even thinking about that. I don't think this this person has the slightest idea of that. They just think that if we get rid of the police, then we're going to have a perfect society. If we pay pay would be criminals and give them money, they won't be criminals anymore. That's a common thing you hear from them. It's all imaginary for them. It's all pretend. Uh, we start, she says, by asking what else needs to be created to cater and serve the needs of the people. So if we just cater to the people and serve their needs, then police become redundant. Abolition will work. So we start by scrutinizing, she says, our budgets. We start by our city budgets. We start by, uh, and, and here it is, of course, the woke part, centering those most vulnerable to harm. So, you know, this is just all faith-based nonsense. They don't have the slightest idea that what they're leading us toward is either some kind of scary digital tyranny that replaces police or something that's absolutely not going to work. And we're going to have basically kind of, you know, organized crime and gang ridden neighborhoods and might makes right because nothing is going to constrain people with no police. We already see this huge uptick in murders. So what does she say? But first we have to recognize that we have to abolish. They don't have a plan. Just abolish, just get rid of it. First, we just have to recognize this. We need consciousness. We have a critical consciousness toward the police and we recognize a step toward abolition. These people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They don't, they don't have the slightest idea how to make any of this work because they have a crackpot theory that believes if you just get the bad parts out of society, then magically the good will arise. Because the good, their article of faith is that the good is already the natural, the perfect, the utopia is the natural state of society once all the reactionary conservative status quo ideas get out of the way. The good will arise once all of the things that are restricting the good from emerging just get out of the way. So I said, you know, we're going to go back to Marx, and you can see this here. You can go all the way back to Marx, Marx's dialectical materialism. He posited that societies, economically, they evolve according to this fixed track in history. He's got his historicism baked into dialectical materialism. Uh, he really kind of picked this up from his mentor Feuerbach, um, who was a young Hegelian progressive. Um, Feuerbach was a student of Hegel. He was a progressive uh, in his orientation. This is a young Hegelian group that arose in the 1820s, 30s or so um, in Germany. Following Hegel's ideas, they believed that there were, they, this, these people believed also that there was a fixed progression of history with a purpose to history, a talos to history of refining, perfecting the ideas of humanity and the world and thus of society. And Marx took all of these ideas, the philosophical ideas, and stuck them into the materialist realm, economics in particular, and said, well, you know, sooner or later, capitalism, and the, he, he gives six stages to society. I'll skip over the first three. Sooner or later, stage four arrives. That's capitalism. You know, we come out of feudalism or whatever. Uh, capitalism emerges, and capitalism matures into this late industrial capitalism. And capitalism's exploitations 
get so obvious they can no longer be ignored because it's inherently exploitative system. That was his idea of surplus value that was being extracted and the workers were being exploited and the capitalists were stealing their surplus value. All of these contradictions, all of these these intolerable conditions, and you know, some some of the conditions going on in the in the mid nineteenth century under kind of big factories, the emergence of industrial society were pretty awful. But sooner or later none of these will be able to be ignored. And what will happen then is we'll progress into socialism. Stage four capitalism will drive into stage five socialism. And that'll happen because the working class will awaken to how crappy their situation is under capitalism. And they'll awaken with a class consciousness into a proletariat. They'll understand, they'll have class consciousness that capitalism is the thing exploiting them. And uh, this is the exact same thing. Okay, this is the exact same thing that we're reading this stupid thread. Once people realize, or in the thread, once people realize that the police are exploiting and creating all these problems in society, once they realize that all of that, and we get a critical, a critical mass of people who know we need abolition and believe it is possible, then we're going to be on the path to an awakened, conscious, abolitionist proletariat, woke proletariat, that's now going to overturn the exploitative capitalist system they live within, or pull, pull, you know, this liberal order with these police that Marcuse said is pre-fascism or proto-fascism at every instant, constant, clear and present danger and emergency waiting to happen. And so then we're going to enter, we'll be able to enter into this managed state where we're going to be able to figure it out. And that's the key. So socialism for Marx was a managed state. The proletariat have awakened under capitalism. They have their class consciousness. They awaken. They seize the means of economic and material production. And now they are the government. And that's socialism. They own the proletariat as a class, owns the, the means of economic and material production. And they are the state. And they are the managers. And under Lenin and Stalin and Mao and probably what's going on now with the weird World Economic Forum people, we're going to have this kind of vanguard group or whatever that's going to manage everything for us. We're going to have this enlightened group within the bourgeoisie that understand the importance of communism in theory, and they're going to just usher us through to this equitable utopia. And we're going to enter into stage five of history, which is a managed socialist state where the workers now, if for Marx, have seized the means of production. They have fused with the state. They have become the state. The workers, the awakened, enlightened workers, run the state now, and they own all the means of production. And so the state, and this is, we're not quite to the not knowing how part yet, the, the heart of Marxism. So the state now owns the, the means of production, fused. This is why fascism, something that's not technically fascism, but looks exactly like and works exactly like fascism and runs millions of people to death uh, under these communist attempts, communist revolutions, always happens, is because you now have a managed state-owned system of everything. Um, not exactly the same fascism that Mussolini or Hitler talked about, but it is still kind of the same thing. And now it's because you have the state where the allegedly the workers, but really it's usually this vanguard that's Leninism on their behalf that own all of the all the means of production and then that's fused with state power and this is the social circumstances is a managed state. And so the idea according to Marx and according to dialectical materialism, which he borrowed off of the ideas of Hegel and turned into what what Marxism is, and this is leaning very heavily on Hegel's ideas, is that once you get the exploitations of capitalism out of the way and enter this managed transition period called socialism, stage five of six of economic history, capital H history, then all of the remaining contradictions are going to be able to start working themselves out. And remember, now the state, now the people who run it are enlightened to theory. They are the intelligentsia. They have, they are, they are working class intellectuals, if you will, and use Gramsci's term for them. They also are class conscious awakened people. They are communists. They have the right ideology. So they will be able to raise the remaining contradictions and work them out the right way because they have the right theory, the right ideology. And so now because everything is managed by this wonderful proletariat who's awakened and understands how everything's going to work, or in this case, where we now have society, there's, you know, cities filled with people who understand that police abolition is what we need and just believe that that is possible, then everything's going to work. And for, for Marx, this is where it transitions into communism, when everybody gets it. For uh, Marcuse, these are the, these historical possibilities that are generally regarded as, uh, as utopian yeah, in repressive tolerance. This is what comes up. So, so with Marx, just to kind of back that up, 
The belief is that when these contradictions in the socialist era come up, they're able to work themselves out in a new and even faster way, and the proletariat-run state becomes less and less and less dependent. In fact, the state within that becomes less and less and less relevant. So it becomes less and less dependent on state management, even by the by a proletariat-run state. And the state part of all of this becomes eventually so irrelevant that everybody is just going to share and be happy and they're just going to dissolve the state. They're going to get rid of the state. They're going to realize, they're going to awaken at the end of history that the, the, the eschaton will immunitize and the, we enter into stage six communism, the end of history, the utopia, the communist utopia. And this immunitized eschaton, as it might be put, takes us out of history's arc history's talos has been fulfilled and we now leave the history wherein material conditions of humanity are exploitative and problematic and harmful and traumatic and we're now in a perfect communist utopia where everybody's liberated from the toils and exploitations of 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 economic life um, this is Marx's view. So the dialectical material process of exposing the contradictions first in capitalism until you get enough discontent and class consciousness to enter socialism, then the people who know how to handle this, the dialectical materialists themselves are in control. So as these things arise, they move even faster. And eventually they say, wow, we've got everything oiled so well, everything running so well that we don't even need to have a state to manage it anymore. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to. The new Soviet man has emerged. We're liberated men now and the utopia communism arrives. This is exactly the same thing when they're saying that we don't know how abolition is going to work, we just have to lean into it. And the communists don't know how this was going to work. And the liberationists, the neo-Marxists, didn't know how any of this was going to work. Communism doesn't know how. The only That's the only problem. We just don't know how any of it's going to work. But it, uh, what, what we do know is if we just abandon everything that we're doing now, whether that's capitalism, whether that's police and replacing that with abolition, whatever it is, if we just consumerism, if we just quit what we're doing now, then what will happen is that we can enter into this managed state where we'll figure it out together. And that's what we see in the thread. We will. You don't have to know how now we're going to figure it out together once we get there. Just believe and we'll figure it out together. So that's the utopian logic in this tweet thread, which I've read all the way through now. And now we're going to kind of revisit. So let's go back. You know, First, she writes, we have to recognize that we have to abolish. We'll figure out the complete how together. So she envisions a state in which we have policing. That's usually in the theory tied to capitalism. She's not talking about capitalism. It protects corporate interests, like it protects your small business, it protects the big business, it protects Starbucks's window, and it protects economic interests. And you know, the state is then paid off to want to protect economic interests so the state can keep on in its cronyism. That's the view, with the cynical view within communism. And so for her, the first step is that we have to abolish that. That's her argument. The first step is that we need this abolitionist consciousness of how the system is failing us, how the police are failing us, how they're failing our communities. Then we can enter into a new state once we've fixed our minds on ab abolition and believe that it's possible. We're enter we'll enter into this new state, and this is quoting her again. Um, we'll figure out the complete how together, leaning on the teachings and writings that already exist. By trying, you know, which ones, right? Uh, which teachings and writings? Are we going to talk about Angela Davis, who supports Jim Jones and was a terrorist? We're going to talk about, like, who? Which writings? You know, these, these people are lunatics. Angela Davis is, like, student of Herbert Marcuse, leader of the prison and, and police abolition movement currently. Big, big time cahoots. So we're going to listen to Black Lives Matter, these deep philosophers. Um, so we're going to figure out the complete how together by leaning on the teachings and writings that already exist, by trying stuff out locally and sharing lessons, as long as we just remember that it is possible. We just need more of us in it, she writes, and this is the most ridiculous collectivist faith in the universe. It has absolutely no concept of how society works, no concept of why crime happens, why human beings are the way that they are, how human societies act or flourish, or how anything is going to work here. There's no concept of any of this. There's no plan. It's exactly the same historicism-based nonsense. Hegel, at least, was doing it philosophically. The young Hegelians trying to make it progressive. Marx did it. The neo-Marxists within liberationism. <sighs> 
And even in liberationism, you read Marcuse, it does include the idea that we're going to abolish the police. We're going to abolish the military. You can read that in repressive tolerance. We have to get rid of our, in a world where armies still exist, he talks about, you know. He brings up the contradiction. That, well, there's no liberation in a world where armies still exist. He brings up the contradiction that war is necessary to maintain peace. He says that's a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It's 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 a response to human nature, which is what it is. And you know, saying, oh well, we'll just redesign human beings at the biological level so that they don't ever want to go to war. That's not going to work. And so this whole thing is like, we'll figure it out later. We'll figure it out together in this new managed state, the socialism, where the abolitionists have now been given the power because they have the right ideas. They have the right ideology. So they're the ones, the people who think we should have no police are going to be the ones that need to be put in charge. And then with them in charge, leaning on the teachings and writings that already exist by like, you know, Angela Davis, a terrorist. She supported, like I said, Jim Jones. She supported the Cuban regime. She supported the Chinese regime. She had absolutely nothing to speak on on behalf of Czech dissidents, despite being a prison abolitionist, allegedly. Czech, Czech dissidents who are imprisoned. Um, she didn't speak out on behalf of them because she actually is just a communist, and she supported whatever the communists were doing, including uh, Castro, including Mao, and then definitely not taking the side of... Um, dissidents to communist regimes in the Eastern Bloc. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to lean into and learn from. These are the these are the writings. And so the goal is going to be that these people who believe we need to have abolition and they're trying to organize and inspire this abolitionist consciousness are going to end up being the people who get to manage the situation for us in the interim. Maybe it's more social workers. Maybe it's paying criminals to not do crime. Maybe it's all this other nonsense that doesn't actually work. They have these stupid ideas that aren't going to work. And then when it doesn't work, they're going to say, well, white supremacy was still involved somehow. That's the, the named problem. And so they're going to manage the state. And, you know, what are these teaching and writing authorities as we're trying stuff out locally? What, what does all this mean? Well, trying, out, trying stuff out locally, yeah, like Chaz and Chop, the George Floyd autonomous zone, these stupid autonomous zones, how are those going? We're going to share the lessons so that we can learn from them. Yeah, we're sharing disasters. Okay, so these people don't have a plan, and that's what I'm trying to get across today. That's the message I'm trying to, to give to you today is that the communists don't know how. So let me go back up to the top here, right? They have this visionary crap, but they don't have the slightest idea how to make any of it work. Instead of asking yourself, she writes, what would you replace the police with? She says, try what it is. We actually need to be safe. So just this visionary sweeping crap. What do we need to be safe? I'll tell you, police. We need police. We need, we need militaries. We actually need those to be safe. Those are the things we need. So instead of what would we replace the police with, try what is it we actually need to be safe? Police. The answer is police. And you've taken that off of the table. This is just visionary nonsense. Um, in the tweet before that, she writes that the process isn't giving folks, or isn't folks giving the masses, I'm sorry. It isn't, the process isn't folks, because they're folks, giving just like Hitler's folks. But Hitler spelled it with a V, so it's obviously not the same thing because German, right? Um it isn't folks giving the masses all the answers. Let that sink in. The process isn't these managers giving anybody the answers. Why? Because they don't have them. Communism doesn't know how. It doesn't know how it's organizing the masses. It thinks that it's just organizing them toward the truth that abolition is the only way forward and then coming up with the answers as we go with them in charge, of course, because they have the right ideas. They have the right vision. They have the right ideology. You don't. They do. So let me read the exact same thing again. Let me change a couple of words. Again, the process isn't giving, isn't folks giving the masses all the answers. It's organizing the masses towards the truth that communism is the only way forward and coming up with those answers together. That's stage five. That's Marxist stage five. That's the managed social circumstance. This is warmed over Marxism that's talking about police abolition instead of the, the seizing the means of material production. And the reason that they don't want to talk about not having answers or giving the masses the answers is because they don't have them. Communism doesn't know how. And as a matter of fact, all they have is this article of faith that if enough people believe in this, that it'll work. If enough people believe in it, it'll work. And I told you before, how many is enough? Everybody. They say critical mass. She says critical mass in this thread. It's everybody. 
because everybody else is, is holding it back, is giving people reasons for doubt, and they're going to be a problem that's going to have to be dealt with, whether it's re-education or when re-education won't take uh, elimination, whether that's through being silenced, censored, and pre-censored, or whether that's through something more horrible. Again, the, her first tweet, even if you don't understand how at the moment, you've got to know that abolition is the only way forward. This is a leap of faith into the communist direction. That's exactly what this is. So I know folks wanted... <laughs> she says, I know folks wanted an exact answer on how. Yeah, no shit. And they deserve one too. They, they deserve not just an answer, but they deserve a clear answer. Not in this garbage, vague language, but one that they can understand. One that can be articulated clearly. If you cannot articulate how your project is supposed to work. If you cannot articulate how to get to that goal in practicable steps, you have absolutely no right to start managing anything or having power over people, especially when you don't even know what's going on. You have no idea what you're doing. How can we figure out what people need to be safe? And you've taken the one answer off of the table. Police is the answer. And you're like, without police, how can we do it though? Magic? Is that what you need? Magic? Okay, so this isn't the first step though, right? That's what she says. This isn't the first step. Knowing how, having an idea how this is going to work. Or at the end, knowing what you would replace police with. This isn't the first step for her. For her, and this is always true in communism, the first step is raising consciousness. It's creating a consciousness. It's creating an awareness that abolition is the way forward, that it is possible to reimagine our societies without police. The first step she writes is realizing that we have to get away from policing, taking the only real answer off the table. That thing has to go away. Why? Because it doesn't produce perfect outcomes. Then, in the communist faith, the good thing will emerge. Or in this case, the abolitionist faith. You just get rid of police and the good thing will emerge. Even if we don't have all the answers quite yet, she says, she doesn't have any answers. They don't have any answers at all. They don't they, they actually don't have any answers, not even quite yet, at all. They, they'd say, well, oh yeah, let's just dive into getting rid of police and we'll figure it out from there together. Well, we already see what's happening. Cities have defunded police and they're refunding them. They're putting money back into police. And this isn't a zero loss endeavor. The police that quit, the police that, lo that left, the police that retired were veterans who had institutional knowledge. They knew how things worked. They knew the processes. They had experience, and they could convey that experience, which isn't necessarily just in the, the police academy or in, the, in, the, in the, the so-called book. They could convey that experience in ways that would make better cops, safer cops, more effective cops, people who had learned tricks on the street dealing with people that actually worked. All that institutional knowledge, has, or a lot of it, has retired or been pushed out of the profession, and it's just lost. In all likelihood, they're not coming back. Um, so these people don't have any answers, right? It, they say She says, it's not on any one person or group to come up with the solutions. Yeah, because nobody has them, because they don't know. Communism doesn't know how. Okay, she says, this is something we have to create together. Okay, so what is she saying? We need collectivism. We need collectivism. We'll figure it out together once we just leap in. But we already see what's going to happen. We're going to rehire police forces. Um, and those police forces, if they are in charge of them, are going to be uh, extraordinarily biased. Okay? So that's a problem. Um, oh, she says we need a critical mass of folks. This is raising consciousness. Who know that we need abolition and believe it is possible. They have to be faith heads in this this abolitionist religion, which is a communist religion the historicist religion. And this is what I need to get back to, and we can start wrapping this up, um, because this is a problem. This is why communist, communism ends up walking or marching millions of people into a blender every freaking time. Every single time it's tried, it's a disaster. Famines, people getting shot. Uh, communism is, you know, starts marching them into a blender. That's something Mike Nano once said, and I can't get it out of my head, so I keep saying it. Um, and it's all because they have this article of faith that if we just get rid of the bad stuff in society and allow the progress of history to progress the way it's supposed to, even though there's that weird managed state in the middle where everything goes bad and that's going to be the disaster. If we just get all the bad stuff out of the way, get into that managed state where all the people with the right consciousness now have all the right power, so we give all the Wokies all the power, then eventually we're going to get to the utopia. And that's the first article of faith 
of communism. That if we do that, we will allow history to progress the way that it's supposed to. We'll get the people who think the status quo is acceptable out of the way. We'll get the conservatives out of the way. We'll get the reactionaries or the rightists or whatever they want to call them. People who think, hey, this is maybe a bad idea. Maybe you should have a freaking plan before we jump in. Those people are reactionaries, okay, according to them. And if we just get all those people out of the way, then we're going to get to the utopia. Because they're their big belief, the corollary of the big belief is that all this bad stuff is in the way and it stays in the way because it's created by people not being on board with their vision. People who don't already believe that abolition is the way forward. People who don't already believe that it is possible because it's not possible. They believe that the the drag on history is created by people not being on board. So if you are one of the people who's not on board, then what? Well, at first you're an annoyance. And then later you have to be convinced. You have to be re-educated. Maybe you have to be forced re-educated. You have to be compelled. You have to self-censor. You have all kinds of things. But if you can't be compelled and you can't be re-educated, then what? If you're not re-educatable and you're not going to get on board with a crackpot faith and you're not going to pretend, then you're going to have to be at least silenced if not done away with. That's where gulags come from. That's why communism marches people into blenders, like I said, by the millions, or ovens, or gulags, or Siberia, or leads them into famines, or mass graves. That's why. This is why. And it's because that their stupid shit that has no plan isn't possible until everybody believes it. And that if it's not working, which it won't because they don't have a good theory, they don't have a good plan, it's all crackpot if it's not working, it must be because people don't believe it ardently enough or correctly enough. So that's why it's going to compel you. That's where you see with the New York Times just recently coming out and saying, look at all of these CEOs who didn't go after the Georgia election law. Compelled speech. This is totalitarianism. This is what we are observing. And you have to be able to see this stuff. And if it doesn't work, it's your fault if you weren't zealous enough, if you weren't proclaiming the slogans, if you weren't on board, if you weren't doing everything. And you're going to be the problem if you're not doing all of that. And this is all based on a stupid leap of faith because most people aren't going to believe that any of this is going to work. Most people aren't stupid enough, frankly, or overeducated enough, as it were, educated into stupidity, to think that you can solve crime problems in dangerous communities by getting rid of the police. That is an idea so stupid that you have to be educated or indoctrinated into it. And the people who hold these ideas say that that's the first step and it's the most important step and we don't have to worry about the house because they don't have any house. They cannot make the argument. I mean, just listen to this. Listen to this. This tweets. The process isn't folks giving the masses all the answers. It's just organizing and doing some nonsense shit. I know folks wanted an exact answer on uh, on how. One that they can understand. That isn't the first step. I know folks wanted an answer on how. One that they can understand. But that isn't the first step. That's because they don't know how. So they can't convince anybody. They don't have the argument. They don't have the truth. They don't have the evidence. They don't have the slightest idea of how anything works. Communism doesn't know how. It's a disaster. It is a total disaster. And so it creates this really nasty situation in which they are not going to be able to convince people that even if they could get a critical mass to to create their movement, to create a revolution, they're still not going to be able to convince everybody. Nowhere ever that communism has ever been tried has it been terribly convincing to the people who have to live under it. And this will never come to be. Their utopia will never come to be. Historicism is false. It will never come to be. And when that managed state, if they can achieve breaking the liberal order, which we will analogize to stage four of, of you know, if we move out of Marx's economic analysis and into a more sociopolitical analysis, this liberal free society is stage four. If we can break out of that into a woke managed state in which the people who have now been powered don't know how as and they start racking up their inevitable failures that they're going to rack up in that stage five wokery which was what the democrat democratic party is literally trying to force us into right now and they're going to start racking up these inevitable failures and when they do because they don't have the slightest freaking idea what they're doing when they start racking these up 
then they're going to have to start cooking up terrible explanations for why it's happening. So imagine we abolish the police. What failures, you know, what failures are going to come? Well, we already see. Not only do we do we see um, the problems, I said we were refunding police and all of this because people need them. I don't remember, was it Vice? Was it Vox? Vice, I think, wrote this article. It just came out the other day saying, yay. So this is what I'm talking about. The ra- failures are going to rack up and what are they going to do? They're going to hide the bodies. That's what they're going to do. They said, yay, 300 fewer police murders have occurred because we defunded the police last year. Now, there's so many fewer police. Okay, so first of all, those aren't even police murders. They were almost probably almost all of them, if not all of them, were justified police shootings in dangerous situations. The overwhelming volume of police shootings are not police murders. There are very few police murders. There are a significant number of police killings. Most of those are justified because crazy stuff's going on in policing. Perps get violent, etc. So there are very few police murders, but there are some, but they're very few. Okay. So some of those, or maybe all 300 of those, wouldn't even qualify as being murders as is framed out in this propaganda rag, but they're going to throw that word around anyway. And so then, um, they say, you know, this is the we're 300 fewer police murders, as they're saying, or 300 fewer police killings, if we're a little bit more accurate, because we've defunded the police. But then you get down into the article, and they actually mention it. The propaganda is so stupid, they actually mention it, that even though there were 300 fewer police killings, there were 6,000 additional homicides, 20 times as many actual real homicides. So these are the failures racking up. This is the disaster that, that we're transitioning into that managed state now unless we turn that back and that disaster is just going to spiral and snowball into a bigger and bigger and bigger mess and what they're going to do is write propaganda to cover it up that managed state disaster that's them doing their local experiments to see what happens Chaz and chop aren't the only failures okay so this is them doing the experiment uh we'll figure out the complete how together she writes leaning on the teachings and writings that already exist by trying stuff out locally and sharing lessons Yeah, Chaz, Chop, George Floyd Autonomous Zone, trying things out locally that's going great. People are dying. Places become shitholes and festivals of disease. 6,000 murders in the past year alone above baseline. And what do they do? It's going so great that they propagandize and say, whoops, 300 fewer police murders that aren't even, wouldn't even have been classified as murders in the first place. Total lies. This managed state is a tyranny of... People, you know, said that Trump was a blizzard of lies. I think that was what Sam Harris said, a blizzard of lies. You don't know a blizzard of lies until you see them start to cover this stuff up, all their failures, what they're doing with the schools and they're lying and saying, oh, we'll we'll just grade less. Oh, we'll get rid of the tests. Oh, we'll get rid of every possible piece of evidence. It shows how failing all of our stupid program is because we don't know how, but you've given us power because we've demanded it and you had no ability to stop us, no spine, no sense to say you don't have a plan so you can't have power. Um, For them, it's all going great. We just have to believe it's possible. The reason there are problems is actually because we haven't hit a critical mass of people. So if all the stupid white supremacists would stop, probably black people would stop beating up Asians because that's white supremacy because they're just lying about their failures. We just have to believe it's possible. That's, That's communism knowing how. And we have to get to a critical mass of people with a critical consciousness that see it the way we see it so that they'll agree with our propaganda when we put it out in front of them. So when people start seeing it failing and they refuse to get on board, these people, as we start tipping from stage four, you know, liberal capitalism or whatever, into stage five, something like their woke socialism, um, as we start to tip there and we give these idiots who don't know what they're doing, they don't have a plan, more and more power, they're just going to have a cascade of failures covered up by a blizzard of propaganda and lies. We see it in our schools, we see it in the murders, we see this all over society right now. We see this in basically everything that they have been given access to. And what's the next thing that they do? Oh, well, we're not going to test anymore. We're not going to evaluate anymore. We're going to reframe these. You know, we're going to only talk about the police killings as other murders because murder doesn't actually occur in a utopia. So the other killings were something else. They were probably white supremacy. We're just going to fudge all this. We're going to cover it up. We're going to propagandize around it. And that's what we're going to go into. And the problem is, is that people aren't actually as stupid as the communists have been educated to be. And so they're not going to buy it, right? They're not going to buy this. Some do, but they're, and the useful idiots defend it. But for the most part, 
they aren't going to buy into this belief system. They, they realize this isn't going to work, that you do actually have to know how. And then the second article of faith in communist ideology comes to the fore is, again, that it only works when everybody who is still alive believes it. And so if you can't be convinced of it, and they don't have the argument to convince you, and they don't have the evidence to convince you, and it's all mounting up against them, if they have the power, and they're not going to have the argument, they're not going to have the evidence, their article of faith, that it only works when everybody believes it, is going to kick into play, and they're going to have to get rid of you. They're going to silence you or get rid of you because it's an article of faith for them. The first article of faith of communism is that the trajectory of history is what it is. And when it's not going there, it's because the reactionaries who aren't on board aren't allowing it. They're stopping it. And then these people don't even know how it's all going to work. They don't have any evidence. They don't have any ideas of how it's going to work. They don't even want to talk about how it's going to work. And so you're going to end up with a lot of people who aren't going to buy it put up against an empowered group of people who occupy a faith position that's totally bogus with almost no plan other than to force people on board into consciousness that agrees with them into swallowing their lies because it's the only thing they know how to do is make people, if everybody swallows the lies, it'll work. That's the article of faith. And then we'll have a utopia if that's if, if, if we all get on board. And that's where you start having people getting massively silenced or purged or going into blenders or death camps or whatever else, depending on the context. I don't know what will happen in this case. Uh, I don't suspect blenders, but maybe. I suspect um, silenced house arrest with strict social credit rules uh, more likely than blenders. I don't see death camps uh, as being too likely, but but that's what's happened in the past. Um, This is why communism fails at heart, though. Is because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how. They don't. They don't have the slightest idea how. And going through this tweet thread, which I don't know if I did a great job with that, though, you can see it. The exact same things happening in this stupid prison abolition shit. It's exactly the same. You know, um, the tweet thread. You know, when I I kind of have it on my computer here, it was 26 hours uh, when I'm looking at it since it was tweeted. It has 26,600 likes already. The account has 100,000 followers. Some of those are probably bots and support. There's all the, a lot of this stuff that's leftist isn't organic on Twitter. The like counts and the retweet counts. But it's all very popular with very young people. This has not been ratioed in any regard, as they say. And I don't think that a lot of people understand when they read this that this is actually the roadmap to a catastrophe. And this is the most explicit place I've ever seen it. We don't know how. It's not our responsibility to tell you how. We're just going to do it. And who do you think is going to get empowered to do it? Them, of course, because only people with the right ideas are allowed to have it. It's not even realistic. I mean, for, for, for fuck's sake, who would possibly do this? Who would possibly try to give up the police as a plan to get rid of crime and to get rid of, uh, to fix society? That's just the most, it's just the most ridiculous thing. Um, so are she, her, Organizer, educator, abolitionist of the 100,000 followers is promoting the faith of communism in the shape of abolitionism. And just like communism, it will result in disaster to the degree that we allow it to be empowered. This will result in dead people. This is a complete catastrophe. 6,000 murders in a year. This will result in dead people. This will disproportionately injure poor and minority neighborhoods. That's where the most of those dead people are going to be. If you don't really understand how this works, you've really got to stop and A, think about it for a minute. So I hope I've laid it out clearly enough for you to get it. And B, start learning to recognize this phenomenon and be able to call it out for what it, what it is, where you see it, and tell other people about it. You have to be able to articulate why it is so that other people can see it too. It's of extreme importance. But the point is, communism doesn't know how. And this thread was beautiful because it tells you explicitly. You don't even need to know how. We're not even going to tell you how. It's not our responsibility to tell you how. We know people want to know how, but that's not the priority. The priority is just having a consciousness where we all head that way, vague, agitprop. That's what you're seeing out of all of these stupid anti-racism statements at your workplace and at colleges, out of the government. They have no plan. So hopefully you're now a little bit more equipped, or at least I hope so. Hope that meets my mission here at New Discourses of pro- providing people with the vocabulary and the understanding necessary to see what's happening in the world around them right now with this woke movement so that they can try to do something about it. And the take home here is that you have to understand that communism doesn't have a plan. Communism doesn't know how.